Hello, Baha'i Blogcast listeners. This episode uh, is really exciting, super cool, an amazing story, an incredible human being. Mohammed Al Samawi is a fantastic writer, storyteller, humanitarian philanthropist, Abrahamic religion guy, great friend of the Baha'i faith, and he has an incredible story to tell. We recorded this before the pandemic, we recorded it before the epidemic, the virus, the quarantine. So we're not making reference to it, which feels a little odd because we live in a very different world these days, don't we? Uh, Everything really changed with the advent of this pandemic and how we look at everything has changed. So the will of God is at work. Things are changing out there um, in some very drastic and profound ways. But we at Baha'i Blog and Baha'i Blogcast really wanted to share this incredible interview, this story this timeless story with you, but just note that uh, we're not referencing the pandemic, which might sound a little strange. I hope you're all staying very safe and following the directives of the health professionals around you and exploring the science of this pandemic, as well as the spiritual pandemic that is happening all around us at the same time, the pandemic of, of despair and materialism and racism that we need to tackle spiritually. So that's what we're trying to do. On this here podcast, please enjoy this wonderful, breathtaking, fantastical story brought to you by Muhammad Al Samawi. Thank you so much. Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, fans of Baha'i Blogcast. It's me, Rain Wilson, once again from my office in scenic Agora Hills, California. And uh, I bet you never thought that we were going to have someone named Muhammad on our show. But we've got a Muhammad on tonight's Baha'i Blogcast, and what a Muhammad he is. Out of, there's probably a good, would you say there's like a, maybe 800 million people named <laughs> Muhammad on the planet? Maybe it's the most common name. What do you think? It is. It is the most popular name in the world. It, and you know that. Mm-hmm. I was just guessing, but that is a fact. That's <laughs> it, probably a fact. It, it is a fact. I'm so excited for this guest. I'm excited for all my guests. But this guest is making me giggle with joy and laughter. This is one of the most beautiful, spiritual, bubbly, funny, remarkable, wise souls you're ever going to want to listen to, you're ever going to want to hear. And you're going to want to hear this story. He's the author of The Fox Hunt. We're going to talk more about that later. Um, An incredible personal story and journey. But before we go to your childhood, before we get to your story, which is remarkable, um... You've just launched something really extraordinary that uh, Baha'is and other fans of Baha'i, Baha'i Dham, Baha'i fans, Baha'i lovers all around the world are going to want to hear about. So tell us, tell us uh, about your new venture. Yeah. So first of all, I want to say thank you so much for, for hosting me. And for me, it's kind of like I can't actually understand how I'm sitting with you now in the same place. Uh I learned my English through watching movies and TV series and just seeing you now with me while when I was in Yemen, I was just like watching The Office and like all the time and now I'm with you. It's, it's amazing. Um, People watch The Office in Yemen? I, we do, actually. Um, That's fantastic. I'm surprised the Yemenites, Yemenites, is it Yemenites? Yemenis. Yemenis don't... Um have their own version. You know, a lot of different cultures start their own version of the office. Maybe that... Well, how would you say office in... Uh, in Maktab. Her- the Maktab? Maktab. Like Al Maktab? Al Maktab, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, now, uh, to answer your question about uh, my organization, I just launched an organization called the Abrahamic House. It's an interfaith organization where we have uh, a house in Koreatown, Los Angeles, and we let a Muslim, a Jew, a Christian, and a Baha'i to stay in this house for free. They don't pay the rent, we pay the rent for them. And in order to stay in the house, they can go to their work, they can go to their universities, they can do whatever they want to do. But in the end of each week, they need to do events that gather people together. 
and we speak about issues about how we can come together because we live now in a community where everyone trying to blame the others and in the Abrahamic house we want people to understand about each other that's fantastic and you've and you've got a Baha'i living there who's the Baha'i we have an amazing Baha'i who's living there her name Maya Mansour um, she actually used to work with you, actually. Yeah, it's Soul Pancake. Yeah. And uh, Maya, she is half Iranian, half African American, and she originally from Tennessee. And now she's the Baha'i who lives in the Abrahamic house. And I love her energy. I love what can she bring in the table. Um, this is great. And so this is also a nonprofit, right? The Abrahamic house? It's- so if- so if people want to donate, they can? Oh, yes. Thank you for asking that. Yes, yeah. it, it is a nonprofit organization, tax deductible. So anyone can donate either from the website or they can contact with us. Um, that's how we can actually give them the house free of rent. So it's the ultimate interfaith kind of ex- petri dish. Yeah, kind of. Like, you know, when I start speaking with people and I say, like, listen, I have this organization is a Muslim, a Jew, and a Christian, and they start laughing and they said, like, oh, going to a bar. But in this case, they're not going to a bar. They're actually speaking about interfaith. A Muslim, a Jew, a Christian, and a Baha'i, and a Baha'i. are living in a house in Koreatown. Yep. And we've got to think of a punchline for that joke. That's amazing. Um, so let's now let's go back in time. How did you get to this point where you're living in Los Angeles? You're a Yemeni guy, young man, and you're living in Los Angeles running Abrahamic House. Mm-hmm. I know the story because I've read your book, but these people haven't. So t- talk to us from the very beginning and also your interest in interfaith activities. Because wouldn't you say that you describe yourself? I would say I describe you as the ultimate Abrahamic guy. Your, your belief system is Abrahamic to its core. Oh, thank you. Yes, I consider myself as an Abrahamic uh, faith person. Uh, I'm a Baha'i, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew. Um, recently, I've been reading a lot about Baha'u'llah, uh, and I'm so fascinated about the Baha'i faith itself. And we will come later, I think, to speak about a little bit how I've been introduced to the Baha'i faith, because I love the way how I've been introduced to the Baha'i faith itself. But um, to speak a little bit about me, just um, I think my journey, what brought me here to Los Angeles is actually my disability. Hmm. Um, I, was, I was always actually angry from God because I have this disability. I have a disability in the right side of my body. I have a disability in my hand and my leg. And when you were a baby, you had a stroke, you were saying. Correct. And uh, since I was a kid, I was feeling jealous from other kids. Mm-hmm. Back in Yemen, I couldn't play football I couldn't ride a bicycle I was feeling jealous from other kids to why them why they can't play and why I can't do that and I have an amazing parents actually both of my uh, parents are medical doctors and they told me that I shouldn't be jealous from other kids because I have a disability and instead of that I need to search the reason why God chose me to have such a disability if that's because God loves me that's why I have this disability and I need to find the reason of why me. So I start searching for the reason why, but I also wanted other kids to be jealous from me. Even if I have a disability, I can play football, but I can re- learn English. And I learned English through watching movies and TV shows. That's mm-hmm. how I started learning how to speak English. And I was always trying to find the reason why God gave me this disability until I was 23 years old. Okay. When I was 23 years old, I met a Christian teacher in Yemen. Now, you need to understand a little bit about the background of Yemen. Most of the population in Yemen are Muslims. It's very rare to find Christians or Jews or people from different faiths. And it's split Shiite Sunni. Correct. But I was living in the north side of Yemen, which is mostly Mm -hmm. Shia. But, you know, even about the Baha'i faith itself, we heard a lot of rumors about the Baha'i faith in Yemen, for example, I heard that the Baha'i faith is a sexual cult. That was, I was actually believing about the Baha'i faith. I wish we were a sexual cult. That'd be a lot more fun <laughs> than like having area teaching committees and cluster reflection. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and like, you know, when I was reading now about the Baha'i faith more and more, I said like, where did the sexual cult they told me about? There's nothing <laughs> called sexual cult. But no, just a lot of potlucks. <laughs> and a lot of firesides and I love that. Uh, but... With this Christian teacher, uh, me and him, we became friends. 
mostly because he's from England, he doesn't speak good Arabic, and I wanted to practice my English with him. So we became friends, and his name is Luke. And Luke, one day he came to me and he told me, Muhammad, I'm leaving Yemen soon. And I felt bad that this person that I already created a friendship with him, he's leaving back to England. So I decided that I want to give him a gift. I want to give him a gift when he go back to his country, he will remember me. But what kind of gift I can give him? So I start searching for gifts. And then I realized something. Back when I was in school as a kid, I had a teacher. And the teacher told me that anyone who's not a Muslim will go to hell. No matter if they are good people or bad people because they don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad. And I couldn't imagine that um, Luke will go to hell because he was so good. He's a good person. So I decided that my gift to him is I will convert him to Islam so I <laughs> save his soul. It's true. That's the ultimate gift. Yep. That's the best Christmas gift it ever. It is. <laughs> I thought that, you know, if I convert him to Islam, then I will save his soul from heaven, uh, from hell to heaven. And that's the biggest gift you can give to anyone. Mm. So I went to him and I gave him a copy of the Quran, the Holy Book of Muslims in English. And I told him, if you care about our friendship, I want you to read it. And my reason was, is that as soon as he started reading the word of God, he will know how much Islam is a great faith and he will convert it to Islam. Mm -hmm. But he surprised me. He told me, if you want me to read your book, I have one condition. Do you know what he asked me for? He gave me a copy of the Bible. And he told me, in the same time I'm reading your book, you need also to read my book. Now, I never thought in my life that I would read the Bible. And even when he gave me the Bible, he actually gave it to me with plastic bags, inside the plastic bags, because he was afraid if someone else would see it with me. In Yemen, it's very dangerous to have a Bible also with you. People will ask you questions who gave you the Bible, and he could be in a bad situation because of that. I went back to my home, and I started reading the Bible. But I started reading the Bible not because I want to know more about Christianity. I wanted to read the Bible just because I want to find the aha. The aha that I can say, aha, my book is much better than this book, and that's why Luke will convert to Islam. Mm -hmm. So I started reading the Bible, but he didn't tell me that the Bible that he gave me has an Old Testament, New Testament. He didn't tell me if I started reading the book from the beginning, I'm actually reading the Jewish Torah. Uh -huh. And I'm only thinking I'm reading only the Christian Bible. Right. So from the first page, and remember that I was searching for the aha, I was just searching for hard questions for Luke from the Bible so he can't answer me and he will convert to Islam. So from, from the first page, I asked, I asked him about creation. I was reading the Old Testament and I didn't know that this is the Old Testament. I thought this is just the Bible. And I started asking him questions and he told me, um, actually, Muhammad, can you go to the middle of the book? And I talked to him, I said, like, what kind of people re reading the book from the middle? <laughs> Why you don't want me to read the book from the beginning? And he told me, because you're reading now the Old Testament. I said, so? He said, you're reading now the Jewish Torah. And when he told me that, I was always wondering why there is always fights between Muslims and Jews. Why there is such hate always. And I've been always thinking that there is something that triggered Jews to hate us. And I wanted to understand why there is such hate. Mm. So I started reading the Old Testament just to find out why there is such hate. Mm. And the more that I was reading from the Torah, the more that I was fascinated about the similarities between Islam and Judaism. They didn't teach me that in school. In school, they teach me that the Torah is totally different from the Quran. It is a holy book, but rabbis changed the Torah totally, so that it is not holy anymore. Didn't they say that about the New Testament as well, that Christians had changed and altered the New Testament, so it's not completely to be trusted uh, in many Islamic circles? Absolutely, it's the same, it's the same thing, actually. Mm -hmm. And when, when I started reading the Torah and I started realizing how it's similar to, uh, to Quran, not only from the stories, not only from the names that I can recognize from the Quran, it's even from the value and the morals rules that you can see there. So what I did, I was able actually to go outside of my comfort zone. I started actually questioning my community. I was questioning my school. Why did they teaching me 
the negativity instead of teaching me about the positivity, how we are similar to each other. So I decided that I need to study more about the Bible, not to question, but to know more. Mm-hmm. I don't want to find the aha anymore. I want to know what's the reason how we are similar to each other. To each other. So I start learning the Bible with Christians in Yemen. And most of the Christians in Yemen, they are from India or Ethiopia. Okay. So, so I was learning the Bible with how them. How did you find a Bible study in Yemen? It's easy. Like, you know, you find Ethiopians or Indians who are actually not Muslims, and you just go to them, speak to them, and you say, can I join you? And also because of Luke, he also introduced okay, me to right. his friends mm-hmm. who are also Christians. But I couldn't find Jews to be also know more about the Old Testament. So I decided that maybe I need to find a Jew and ask them questions about the Old Testament. So I was searching for a Jew in Yemen, and I couldn't find any. That sounds like a uh, title of a, of a book, your next book, <laughs> Searching but, for a Jew in Yemen. And But what happened to me is that I found something else called Facebook. <laughs> so on Facebook, I was searching for Jews. The question is how to find a Jew on Facebook also. <laughs> so I start searching for the word Israel. And what I was thinking about, anyone from Israel will be a Jew. And then I start realizing that I never used actually Facebook. Mm-hmm. And when you, word, when you write the word Israel on Facebook, they give you this all options. And honestly, Israel has a lot of beautiful girls from Israel. Uh, <laughs> so I start adding them as friends. And you can imagine that nobody accepts my request. <laughs> yeah, a guy named Mohammed. Yeah, exactly. Will you be my friend? Oh, yeah. And, and you need to see like even my profile picture at that time. I had like a big mustache and like <laughs> Mohammed and like wearing the Yemeni clothes. Uh, so nobody accept my request. And then I realized that this is not the way how you use Facebook. So I started sending private messages and my messages was just copy based. It was like this. Greetings from Yemen. My name is Mohammed. I know that you're a Jew. I know that you live in, uh, you live in Israel. What do you think of Muslims? What do you think of Yemenis? You're sincerely Muhammad. And you can imagine with such a message also, not a lot of people will respond, right? It's like a Nigerian prince ask you for like a million dollars or something like that. But I was lucky that a couple of people responded. The first person who responded, his name Nimrud bin Zayef, who lives now in Philadelphia, actually. Mm-hmm. At that time, he was living in Tel Aviv. And he responded and he's like, Muhammad, like, you know, I have a lot of friends who are actually Muslims, Jews and Christians and from different faiths and we live all in peace. So he started introduce me to this amazing friends of him. And at that moment, everything changed my life. For the first time in my life, I found the reason why God gave me such a disability. I decided to become an interfaith activist. You see, it's because of my disability, I learned how to speak English. And, wow. and because of that, I was able to meet Luke. And because I met Luke, I was able to read the Bible and the Torah. And eventually I was on Facebook speaking with all these people from different faiths. And that's why for the first time I said to myself, I will just write on Facebook about the similarities. I will not do the same thing as I've been used to learn in school about the differences. Right. I will focus about how we are actually together. The so same. let's get a little metaphysical here. Remember that movie Sliding Doors with Gwyneth Paltrow. Mm-hmm. There's a different version of the world in a parallel universe in which Muhammad al-Sawami yes. um, was did not have a stroke as a baby and um, was physically without any uh, disabilities and a mm-hmm. soccer enthusiast. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what, what what would your life be like in Yemen now had that been the case? You, you, you know, you, you just touched my heart because like I'm just thinking without my disability, I wouldn't be a peace activist in the first place. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be even with you now, sitting with right. you. I, right. would, I would be in Yemen suffering because of the war in Yemen. Thank God, God that God gave me such disability. Wow. So um, that's how my disability actually changed me to become an interfaith activist. But unfortunately, being an interfaith activist in Yemen is not an easy thing. No. And, I, and I put myself in a lot of risks. What are the risks of being an interfaith activist in Yemen? And how did that uh, lead you on this strange path to my office in Agora Hills? Mm. Yeah, that's an important question because it's not only about interfaith activists, it's about being an activist in Yemen, period. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you see, back in Yemen, and I'm speaking about Yemen before the war, so I'm speaking about Yemen before 2013, we used to have one president that he was the president of Yemen for more than 32 years. And he never wanted us to focus that we don't have good education in Yemen. We don't have good hospitals in Yemen. So he always wanted to focus us on a fake enemy. So instead of protesting on the street against him, we will focus on the fake enemy. And he created this fake enemy for us, being the Jews, Israel, anyone who basically different than us. And when I start doing my activism, that's when I put myself in risk. Hmm. Because the government don't like the work that I'm doing. Extreme groups like Al-Qaeda, Houthis, they don't like the work that I'm doing. But I couldn't stop doing interfaith because that's the reason of my life, as I explained before. But one day, everything changed in my life because I was feeling lonely in Yemen. Okay. I was feeling that I am the only interfaith activist I know in Yemen, and I want to encourage my friends also to do the same. So I went to my friends, and I asked them, do you want to practice your English? Because if I told them you will just speak with the Jews and Christians, they will not do it. Uh-huh. So they said to me, sure, how? I said, well, there is a new way called Skype. I will put you on a Skype with people who can speak very good English, and you just speak with them. I didn't tell them that they are actually speaking with Israelis. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, because I didn't tell them it was a mistake, it put me actually in risk. Wow. After the call, my friends went to their parents and they started giving rumor about me that I am an agent for Mossad. And I want to recruit them to be also an agent for Mossad. You would make an excellent agent for Mossad, I think. <laughs> yeah, with my disability, sure. Um, but because of this such accusation, everything in my life changed. I started receiving threats on Facebook. Oh, wow. People with Osama Bin Laden picture. Uh, and I was, of course, afraid. But in the end, it was a Facebook threats. And I was trying always to not only care about myself, but also care about my family. Yemen is a family-oriented culture. So when I receive a threat, because I live in the same house with my parents, with my siblings, I don't just take the responsibility of my actions, but also my family will take responsibility of my action too. So when people accuse me for being agent from Mossad, you imagine what kind of threats they received also because of me. Mm. But I couldn't stop and I was traveling all the time. And until 2014, everything changed in Yemen. There is a group called Houthis. I don't know if you heard about Houthis before, but they are an extreme group. They are Shia. They have this disgusting logo which says, death to America, death to Israel, damn the Jews. And they came, they controlled the capital city of Yemen, Sana'a, where I used to live. And they controlled the police station. They put the president of Yemen as a hostage in his home. And they basically became the government in Yemen. And not to get all political, but there's much talk about how they're supported directly by Iran. They are supported directly by Iran. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the reason why they exist in the first place is because of Iran. I always say that Houthis are the Yemeni version of Hezbollah. They've been created by Iran to make this chaos that we are having now in Yemen. Mm-hmm. But in any way, and also like Houthis, unfortunately, right now, they are the one who are doing all this bad uh, tasks against Baha'is okay. in, in, in Yemen. Right. But in any way, because of this, I, when I went back to Yemen, I received a phone calls. And the phone calls basically was a personal threat of my life. And I had to leave Sana'a because of the threats that I received. Mm-hmm. I decided to leave because I don't want my family to be in risk. And I was in another city called Aden, far away from my family. And I thought I would be safe from Houthis, but actually I was in a much worse situation because when I escaped from Houthis, I was in a city that controlled by Al-Qaeda and other extreme groups. Okay, okay. So Al-Qaeda was coming in to fight the Houthis, but Al-Qaeda is supported by Saudi Arabia and is uh, Sunni. Correct. Right. So correct. But you had two kind of terrorist groups 100%. supported by two different sides of the... Uh, 
uh, of the Muslim world. Yeah, and, and we need actually to speak a little bit about it because it's a little bit confusing. Okay. Um, what happened that the president of Yemen was a hostage in his house. So when he escaped from Houthis, he also went to Aden, the same city I escaped to. Okay. And when he went to Aden, because he didn't have this army to protect him anymore, he asked tribes in Yemen to protect him. And a lot of people who come to protect him, they're actually ex-fighters from Al-Qaeda or extreme fighters from Salafis and Sunni groups. And that's how he was protected by Sunni groups who also hate Houthis. But the bad thing happened that Houthis, they didn't stay in Sana'a and that's it. They came all the way to Aden and the civil war started. A civil war between two extreme groups and I was in the middle of that war. I was planning at that time actually to go back to Sana'a, but I, could, I couldn't go back mm -hmm, anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was hiding in a small apartment. And at that time I was working with an organization called Oxfam. I contacted my organization, I asked them if they can help me. And they gave me the bad news that they did evacuation for all the international stuff and they don't have anyone to help me. I started reaching to friends, to family, to ask them if they know anyone who can help me out to escape from the conflict, what's happening in Aden. So you're stuck in this apartment in Aden. Correct. And Aden, Oxfam has already evacuated people. The civil war is starting. The Houthis are descending on Aden at the same time. You're calling everyone you possibly can, and mm -hmm. you're basically trapped in the middle of a war. I was, I was trapped. Not only that, I was hiding in this small bathroom inside the apartment because I thought that the bathroom is the safest place for me. Okay. And I start freaking out because I start seeing pictures from Facebook that extreme groups catch, catch, capture anyone from the north or anyone who's Shia, like me, like my background, and they torture them in the streets. How do they tell that they're from the north? Oh, that's a good question. It's from three things. We have different accents between people from the north and people from the south. It's mm -hmm. like someone from Texas go to New York. You can mm -hmm. realize that he's from Texas. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing, the way how I look like. I look like someone from the north, not someone from the south. The skin is a little bit bitter, lighter than the people from the south. And the third thing is like my last name, Samawi. Mm -hmm. So if anyone took my ID, which Al-Qaeda was doing at that time, and they see my last name, they will know that I'm actually Shia, I'm actually from the north. So that's why I couldn't move out even from my apartment, because Al-Qaeda made a checkpoint just downstairs of my building. What? Yeah. So imagine that with my disability, I don't cook, unfortunately. I didn't have an enough food supply. I didn't have enough water. And I started freaking out. And because of the pictures that I see on social media, I decided maybe I need to kill myself. Oh, no. Because if I killed myself, at least I will not be tortured like the picture that I see. And my family will not see my pictures being tortured on Facebook. That's, oh, what, I, that's what I was thinking about. But before I did that, I prayed to God. And I told God, God, if you help me out, I promise you that I will find you and I will keep doing activism. And what happened is that the last thing I did before I decided to kill myself is using social media. Okay. I sent messages to every single one that I know on social media. Do you know anyone who can help me out to escape from my apartment? And I thought the people who would respond is people from my country, from my neighborhood, right. mm -hmm. will come and help me out. Mm -hmm. But imagine what? Four people who responded to my request are four Americans. They barely know me. Mm. And they said, yes, we want to help you. And it's crazy because the first one, his name, Daniel from New York, uh, and I hope like he will listen to this. So hi, Daniel. Um, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> when I met Daniel, I met him in a conference in Bosnia, Sarajevo, for a Muslim Jewish conference. And he was dancing breakdance. And I only spoke with him for five minutes. So when he responded to my message, I was thinking like, really? Can someone like him <laughs> who was dancing breakdance can help me to escape from Al-Qaeda? But at least he said yes. And the second one, her name Megan, and Megan also. Hi, Megan. She lives. All, hey, Megan. Uh, she lives. Thank you. Uh, she lives in Washington D.C. And Megan, um, at that time, she sent an email to all her friends asking them, "Do you know anyone in Yemen who can help my friend to escape from his apartment?" And she sent this email to all her friends, including Justin Hafter, who lives in San Francisco. 
but she didn't know that actually Justin knows me. I'm actually the only EMA that he knows. That's crazy. So when he received the email, he responded by saying, Hi, Megan, I actually have a friend in Yemen. Maybe my friend will be able to help your friend. <laughs> so tell, tell me, he writes you to yes. ask to see if you can help you no, he, get out of your apartment. <laughs> no, he, ge- he gave her my contact information and she told him, Justin, I am speaking about Muhammad. <laughs> that's, it's, who, that's who it is. It's the same person. Unbelievable. And Justin, hi, Justin. Justin now. Uh, hi, Justin. Um, Thanks, Justin. And Justin basically stopped doing everything and trying just to help me out at that moment. And the fourth person is Natasha. And Natasha now lives in uh, Jerusalem. Hi, Natasha. Hi, also. Natasha. And, Thank, thanks so much, Natasha. And Natasha also contacted me and she said, I want to help. Now, the four of them, they don't have any military experience. They don't know almost nothing about Yemen. Sure. And they barely know me, except mm-hmm. Megan. But the, the other three, they barely know me. But they believed on me and they said yes. And there is actually a phrase which I love a lot from the Quran and also from the Talmud. It says, who saves a life, save the whole world. They never stopped believing in me. Mm -hmm. And even though Al-Qaeda was downstairs, they started, the first thing they did, Mm -hmm. they post on their Facebook and they asked their friends, does anyone has an idea how we can help someone escape from Al-Qaeda in Yemen? Oh, my God. Imagine how much their friends was making fun of their boss. Um, <laughs> actually, Daniel, a friend of him, contacted him and he said, Daniel, I think someone hacked your account from Yemen <laughs> <laughs> because of his boss. But the crazy thing that in 13 days, these four people were able to do a military operation for me. Um, what? Yeah. How? Incredible. These four people, because they start from Facebook and friends of friends of friends of friends they were able to reach the State Department. They were able to reach people from the government. And eventually they reached India, who was doing evacuation for their own citizens. Okay. And they asked the Indian government if they can do also an operation for me. How are they evacuating? On airplanes or boats or what? It was a military ship. Military ship was in the harbor of Aden, of evacuating of Aden. Indian citizens, Correct. workers... Uh, military, at that, at government that, employees? Yeah, at that time, all the countries was doing evacuation for their own citizens. Unfortunately, America didn't do evacuation for Americans, but other countries was doing evacuation. Mm-hmm. So these people was trying, the four of them, they contact France, they contact uh, Japan, Russia, all the countries asking them, can you help Mohammed? And all the countries said, no. The only country said maybe is India. Mm-hmm. And there is a senator uh, he used to be the center of Illinois, and I don't know if you know him because he's a friend of the Baha'i community. His name's Mark. Senator Mark Kirk. Yeah, Mark Kirk. Yeah, I've spoken to him before. Yeah, and he's, he's a great Baha'i sen- supporter. Yeah. Senator Mark Kirk, he has a disability that's similar to my disability. Oh, wow. And when he heard about the situation that I have, mm-hmm. he decided that he needed to make a step. So he started contacting people from the State Department at that time. Mm-hmm. It was Obama administration. And they were able to send a letter to the Indian government, an official letter from, Ameri- from, wow. from the American government, asking them if they can help me out. And India said yes. So the evacuation started. And it's crazy because the evacuation was on March 2015. So now it will, it will be almost five years ago. Wow. Uh, we have one week left and it will be the fifth anniversary. So was it easy for you to get from that bathroom no, over no, to no, the no. ship? Oh. And I, I was trying to jump a little bit because it's a, it's a long story. And mm-hmm. I want also to encourage people to read the book. But Yeah, don't tell everyone everything because <laughs> uh, they want to read the book. Yes, but... but the Fox Hunt, available now from what to press? From everything, from Amazon and uh, HarperCollins. No, HarperCollins, HarperCollins, yeah. yeah. Okay, but, but, but you can find it in Amazon and other places. But what happened is that when I was hiding from my small apartment... Um, with the help of the four people, I managed to go to Sheraton Hotel and ha- I was hiding with the United Nations there until the evacuation started. And the four of them, they told me, you need to go to the port to be evacuated. I went to the port. And I just want to say for you listeners, because I've heard the story, A, and B, I've read the book. There's a lot of juicy stuff he yes. just left out about getting out. Of, I was kind of setting him up. Of getting out of the apartment, 
yeah. his phone dying. Do you want me to tell that? No, no, okay. it's okay. They need to read the book. And then getting to the Sheraton, and then what was it? They wouldn't, they, you had to go, so, they wouldn't let you in, no, and then you had to go down to the, the yeah. guy let you in the kitchen or something like that? The basement, the basement. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, like when... But don't don't tell him, the guy will get the book. Okay, tell him a little bit. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would just say a small thing. Um the only way that I was communicating with these four people is by using my phone, by using social media. And you need to understand that at that moment, there was no electricity in Yemen mm-hmm. because of the war. Until now, unfortunately, there is no electricity in Yemen. So I, used, I, I was using my laptop as a charger for my phone. And my phone has a 2G, 2G internet. It's very slow internet, but it was the only way how I can communicate with the four people. And when I decided that when Megan contacted the United Nations and the United Nations told her, we can help Mohammed if he can come to Sheraton Hotel in Aden. So Megan contacted me and she said, you need to go to Sheraton Hotel. I said, how? You know that Al-Qaeda is downstairs. If I go downstairs, they will just kill me. She told me, contact Oxfam, ask anyone to help you out. So I contacted Oxfam and I asked them, can you please send me a driver to drive me from my apartment to the hotel? And that's it. I don't need anything from you. At that moment, my phone died. Mm. And I didn't know whether Oxfam would send the car or not. And I didn't have uh, like battery in my laptop. So I was waiting, looking to the window. And in 30 minutes, I saw a car waiting near my building. And I thought to myself, this is Oxfam car. If I don't go out right now, he may drive away. That exactly. May be it. That may be the la- yeah. That might be the end of it. So I need to make a decision, and because of my disability, I can't run. So I basically decided not to take anything with me except my laptop and my phone. I went downstairs. The first attempt it didn't work out. I was in my apartment. I tried the second time. I went to the car. I opened the door. I closed the door and I told him, "Go, go, go!" And he looked to me. He said, "Who are you?" I said, "Oxfam." He looked to me. He said, "What's Oxfam?" <laughs> he was not the driver from Oxfam. <laughs> he was just some dude. And I collapsed in his car. I started crying. I told him, please help me out. I started showing him my disability. And this man really reminded me of Yemen before the war because there was no really difference between Shia or Sunnah or between people from the north or south. with all Yemenis. And he decided to risk himself. Like the worst thing that could happen to Megan, Justin, Dan, and Natasha is losing the communication with me, which could happen with happened to them multiple times. But this man decided to risk his life. He drove me to Sheraton Hotel. There was more than checkpoints. Stopped the car. I was hiding in the back seat. Everyone was opening, like you open the window and they took his documentation, ask him question and let him go. Every time I was thinking that if they will just open the door. And they see me, they will just kill me and kill him. Oh my gosh. So I arrived to, uh, to the United Nation. And at that time, I had security, I had food, everything was perfect. Until, and again, like that's a lot of details in the book, but I found myself in a couple of days alone. And the United Nation left me alone in this big hotel called Sheraton Hotel, which, by the way, is being bombed now. Oh. So at that moment, they were contacting India. There was, was there food there? Was there, there was everything. power? Yeah. yeah, there was everything because you, uh, Sheraton is a big hotel at that time. And the UN decided to shoot this hotel because of that. At that moment, um, the evacuation started and the four of them, they told me, you need to go to the port. The hotel staff helped me out to go to the port. I was in the port when I see 400 Indians want to be evacuated by small fishing boats because... The Indian military decided not to come all the way to the port, the ship. It was too risky for them. Mm -hmm. So they put the ship in the middle of the sea. Okay. And the only way you can go there is by small fishing boats. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, they didn't allow me to go. They said, you are not in the list. And again, the four four Americans, heroes, they did an amazing job on it. So they're connected with you this whole time by Facebook. Like, oh, we'll make a call for WhatsApp, you. Yeah, WhatsApp, yeah, WhatsApp, Facebook, yeah. Skype. That's what yeah. the three things. On Twitter also, sometimes mm-hmm. they were using Twitter. But it's amazing. Like, you know, just by using social media, they were trying to know what's happening to me. Mm-hmm. And they were able actually to contact also with the military chip to the Indian captain and tell wow. him about my, my situation. Yeah. And the evacuation happened to me. And that's how I was evacuated from Yemen on Passover, actually. I crossed the Red Sea 
from mm -hmm. Yemen to Djibouti. Like Moses. But in the wrong, in the wrong direction. Okay. <laughs> and in this time, it wasn't Moses. It was me, Muhammad. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the amazing thing about it, and like this is now the, the nice part, when I was in Djibouti, we were the first Yemenis ever to escape from the war in Yemen. Mm. And the Djibouti government, they didn't, do, they didn't know what to do with us. India, they decided that they will not take me to India. They would just leave me in Djibouti. So I was in a jail with other Yemenis. And I thought that's this the end. I don't know what would happen to me. The amazing thing happened. These four people, they didn't give up on me. They wrote on Facebook, does anyone know anyone in Djibouti? Ah. <laughs> and fair enough, a friend of Daniel from Belgium, she said, I used to know someone from Sri Leone who used to work in Djibouti. This person sent his friend. His friend came to the jail. And he says, where's Mr. Mohammed Samawi? And all the Yemenis, who are you, man? Why they are they talking about your name? <laughs> I was out of the jail. They gave me 10 days visa. And these four Americans asked me this amazing question, which is, do you want to come to the United States? Mm. I said, I would love to come to the United States. The question is how? They posted on their social media again. And they said, does anyone want to invite Muhammad to come to the United States? They were able to manage seven, eight invitations from me, from Stanford University, Moshe House, uh, different Jewish organizations. Yeah. And I basically went to the American embassy in Djibouti and I thought they will never give me the visa. They did. They gave me the visa. I was so happy. And then I told the four of them, thank you so much. I have the visa. Now, there's two things you need to understand at that time. I didn't have luggage. You didn't have money. I didn't have money and I didn't take a shower for a long time. Oh, no. <laughs> and now how I can buy a ticket to come to the United States. They told me, Mohammed, don't worry about that. Because we were boasting about you all the time on Facebook, Already our friends, friends of friends, they know all about your story. There is someone named Chris from Texas. He doesn't know even the whole story. He decided to buy my ticket to the United States. He Thanks, Chris. Hope Chris, you're listening. Chris from Texas. He's an amazing guy, by the way. Hi, Chris. Um, Chris decided to buy for me a business class ticket from Djibouti to San Francisco. Amazing. Imagine someone like me with no luggage, dirty clothes, Everyone was looking to me in Djibouti, can he travel or not? And I have a business class ticket. <laughs> it was a little bit kind of like a dream. The only clothes are the clothes on your back. Correct. That you've been wearing for like eight days. Yeah. And this is like where I came to United States. When I arrived to United States, the plan that Justin will pick me up because I didn't know what's Uber. I don't know what's Lyft. I don't know how to use taxi in United States. It's like my first time in United States, for God's sake. Justin had an accident. He couldn't pick me up. And again, they used Facebook. And they said, does anyone want to pick up Mohammed from <laughs> San Francisco airport? Yeah. And this beautiful woman named Jenna, which is an amazing friend, which is, Hi, also, which is also a board member Thank of you. my organization. Oh, Thank you, Jenna, for all, everything. Jenna, she shared the post on her Facebook asking anyone, does anyone know anyone in San Francisco can give me a, a ride? And uh, an amazing Chinese guy, he said yes. He doesn't, mm. he doesn't have even a car. He rented a car and he came all the way to the airport with this big sign. It says, Mohammed Samawi. This is the first person I see in the United States. Oh my God, United that's States. great. So I saw him. I started crying, running to him. Yeah. And he didn't know the story. He just thought that he was doing a, a favor for Jenna. Yeah, yeah. So he looked to me running to him and crying. And I gave him the biggest hug ever. And I said to him, thank you so much. You saved my life. And he was saying, like, what? Why? <laughs> what are you I said, about? what do you mean why? I just came from Yemen. And he said, so? He doesn't know even that there's a war in Yemen. Okay. And all that I'm thinking about, like, oh, my God, he doesn't know anything about me. Why did he come to pick me up? Mm. I understand why later on. Because when I was with him in the car, he asked me this weird question, which is, so, Mohammed, from where you know Jenna? And I looked at him and said, who's Jenna? Because I didn't know Jenna at that time. I didn't know that she shared the boss of Daniel. Right, right. And he was so devastated that I didn't know Jenna. So he started driving a little bit like fast. And all I'm thinking about, like, oh, my God, I made it all the way from Al-Qaeda, from <laughs> Houthis, and now I will die in San Francisco yeah. <laughs> because of his driving. So I started telling him a little bit about the story. And he told me that's an amazing story. And I, like, he was so sorry that he almost gave me a heart attack. <laughs> but 
also uh, he shared with me that he has crush on Jenna. Oh, okay, of course. And he <laughs> thought that I know Jenna and I will give Jenna a call and say, Jenna, he's an amazing guy, you should date him. But he was disappointed that oh. I didn't know Jenna. <laughs> and he also felt bad that about what happened to me. So he, had, he invited me for my first meal in the United States. He told me, are you hungry? I said, yes. So he invited me for KFC. This was my first meal KFC, in the KFC, huh? Wow. K- Kentucky Fried first Chicken. First class. Yes. Fantastic. Oh. Um, and that's how I came to the United States. That's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, I have so many more questions for you. Um, what happened when you got to the United States and how you eventually got your green card, what you know, your adventures have been for the last four and a half, five years here. But the biggest adventure of all is that your story was optioned for a screenplay and is potentially knock on wood, going to be made into a feature film. Yes. How did how did you get your story out in such a way that people would find out about it and turn it into a screenplay and also you turning it into your book? How did yeah. that happen? Yeah, and and still, like, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing for me as a refugee that I was able to... Because all the, all the refugees, I always say, all, most of the refugees who come to the United States, they have such a powerful stories, even better than my story, but they don't have time to tell their own stories. Uh, and when I came to the United States, actually, my dream was to work at Starbucks. <laughs> that was my dream. And I wanted actually to forget even about my activism. Mm-hmm. I was really afraid that if I would keep doing activism in the United States, Al-Qaeda will come all the way and Houthis will come all the way from Yemen. They will kill me in the United States. Mm-hmm. But the longer that I stayed in the United States, the longer that I understand the better I understand that there is something called freedom of speech in the United States. Nobody will kill you if you are, if you are speaking different than what they, what they want to speak about. Nobody will kill you if you are different, basically. So I start uh, speaking more about the story. I didn't work at Starbucks at all, unfortunately, but one day I was speaking in a small dinner with a couple of friends. And the movie producer, Mark Platt, which I consider consider him as a father to me. So hi, Mark. I'm I'm sure you will you will you will hear that later. Hi, Mark. Um, Mark is such a beautiful soul. He told me I want to make a movie about 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 your life, and I was really afraid how to make a movie about my life. Uh, what's the right thing about it? Mark is such an honest guy, and from the beginning he told me that this is a movie, and in the movie they don't take all what happened to you and they make it as a movie they change it Mm -hmm. it will be based on true story sure and mark started telling me like how this movie will help the activism that i am trying to do the interfaith activism but also will help me out to spread the word about what's going on in yemen Mm -hmm. so i decided to do it and right now we just finished the script uh it was written by josh singer which is also hi josh uh, Josh, he, I'm getting tired of saying hi to so many people. <laughs> Josh, he wrote uh, the movie called Spotlight. He w- he won the Oscar for for Spotlight. Brilliant. And yeah. and um, he wrote an amazing script. I can't wait to see it as as a movie. But I'm lucky for that. And then Mark was honest with me, and he told me you just need to understand that a lot of the things that he want to capture in your story, we will not be able to capture it in a movie. Mm. So he advised me, maybe it's better for me to write a book. Mm. And that's how I wrote the book, which is interesting because usually people write a book. And yeah, then if and you, then they option it for a screenplay. Exactly. Turn it, yeah. But for me, it was kind of like the, the opposite. Okay. So I started writing the book, which is The Fox Hunt, now became translated to eight languages. Oh my goodness. And it became... So a, the book's done really well. Yes, and became a bestseller. And um, I'm really happy about the message that... Um, and again, it was hard for me to write about myself, but it took me six months to finish it. Wow. Because everything was still fresh for me. Yeah. And of what happened to me. And the book, when I wrote it, I wrote it for four main, main reasons. And the first reason is that I want people to understand that it's not shame to be different. Yeah. My disability, it's because of my disability I became the activist who I am. So sometimes we have problems in our lives and we don't know that maybe this problem will make something good for us. Um, and the second thing is that I want people to understand the four people who helped me out. It didn't take from them money. It didn't take from them to be Superman or Batman. It took from them that they believed in themselves and they believed on me. 
mm-hmm. and they were able to help me out. And the third thing is that... I think that's really important before we skip mm-hmm. forward. Here's some people who just get a random message on Facebook. Hey, can you help me get out of Yemen? And they're like, they take it on. And they're connecting with each other as they're communicating. So they're like, hey, Justin, you tell... No, so, so, so yes and no, because they like really didn't know each other. Right, but they got connected eventually. Correct. Like, yeah. Um, but these people who are, you know, they're doing this or doing that. They have jobs. They're, who knows? They're working at Starbucks. Who knows what they're doing? Mm-hmm. But they're able to make a huge difference in the world just by stepping up exactly. and doing something. And just trying, like, I don't know, how do you get a guy out of Yemen? Let's call this guy. Or I knew this guy who used to work there. We'll call Oxfam. We'll call the uh, State Department or whatever. And made such an incredible difference. And that's such an, uh, a valuable lesson. People feel so small these days. They feel like no matter what they do, they can't really affect change in the world just by themselves. I, I, I wrote in my book in the first page, this to everyone who says yes. Oh wow! They said yes, mm-hmm. and 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 believe me, you know when they said yes, they didn't know how they do it. They mm-hmm. just want to help, mm. whatever it takes. I remember that I was in my apartment hiding from Al Qaeda, and I started hearing this gun shooting and like shouting and things like that. I was really afraid, and I was calling Daniel on WhatsApp, and he responded to my call, and I I hear his voice that he's sleeping, and I told him I'm so sorry. I I just I need to speak with someone and I called you. He's like, no, 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 don't worry, speak with me. Mm. I will never forget these small things, mm. how much it mattered to mm. me, that they were always there for me. Mm-hmm. They're my four angels. Mm. Uh, there, it's true that I am here in the United States and unfortunately my family is still back in Yemen. But I do have family here, which is yeah. these four people who helped me out. They are like the best family I can have. Do you know how I'd like to help you? How? I'd like to get you a job at Starbucks. Oh, that would be amazing. I'm going to walk you down the road to the Starbucks. Oh, that would be great. I'm going to put on one of those stupid green aprons on you <laughs> and get you behind, get you making some coffee. I need I need a triple soy latte with a sk- <laughs> pump of skinny mocha. All right? Do you remember that? I love it. Okay. I love it. And and maybe even we can do, a, we can do like... A, Starbucks in Abrahamic House or something like yeah, that. That, yeah. would be, that would be sponsored by Starbucks. Idea. Exactly, would be great. <laughs> but um, and I want to say about the fourth, the fourth, re- uh, the third reason, the fourth reason, the third reason was, I want people to understand that not everything that you've been taught is the absolute truth. Not everything that you learn from the mosque or synagogue or church is the truth. You mm-hmm. need you need to search for the truth by yourself. Mm-hmm. And this is something that I love about the Baha'i faith, mm. that you need to search for the truth. It's one of the principles. You went on your own journey of the independent investigation mm-hmm, of exactly, truth. Yeah. Exactly. And it's such an amazing thing that you need to read. And don't let someone else tell you about the information. You need to know it by yourself. Go to, go to the source by yourself. Mm-hmm. And the final thing, I want people to understand what's happening to my country, Yemen. Because people in Yemen are suffering so much. Yeah. And unfortunately, I'm lucky that as a Yemeni to be here in the United States. But... President Trump announced uh, lately the Muslim ban, which is affecting people from different Muslim countries, including Yemen. A lot of people from Yemen, they can't come to the United States. Mm -hmm. If you think that I have a good story, you need to wait for other Yemenis who have such more amazing stories, including the Baha'is in Yemen who are suffering right now. They have a lot of stories to tell. Yeah, there's a lot of Baha'is in Yemen. Yeah, but... They're suffering really bad. They're suffering and... What can you tell us about that? What What do you know... What have you learned? Because it's hard to get real information out of the country. We, we, you have an extreme group like Houthis who are having their orders directly from Iran. They do the same thing as the Islamic Republic in Iran do against Baha'is. Right now, the leader of Houthis, he gave a speech, which is everyone can find it on YouTube. If you search about Houthi leader, if you write Houthi leader um, Baha'i, just write Houthi leader Baha'i, you will hear him speaking in a video about the Baha'i faith that is actually created by the Israeli Mossad, that is a faith that against Islam and need to convert everyone to Baha'is and it's not a true, a true faith. Imagine the hate against the Baha'is happening right now. It's not from the Yemenis themselves, it's mostly from the Houthis. 
Baha'is right now, they are afraid because they put them in jail. They can't have houses anymore. They take wow. their they take their cards, they take their money, and basically Baha'i is having a hard time. But let me tell you something. Baha'i Yemenis are one of the most strong Baha'is. And like when I hear the stories of the Baha'is in Yemen, I feel so proud to be Yemeni. Um, mm. The people in Yemen, the Baha'is, even with this all problems, they never give up on their own faith. Mm. They never give up on Baha'u'llah and the teaching of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. But I will say something that after the video, and remember when I was speaking about difficulties and how difficulty can be a good thing. Mm -hmm. After the video of the Houthi leader against the Baha'i faith, because a lot of Yemenis, they hate Houthis. When they heard him speaking against Baha'is, you know what they did? Mm. They started wanting to know more about the Baha'i faith. Oh. So he actually did a good thing for the Baha'i faith. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And how, is your family okay? My family is okay. Um, they're just suffering as other Yemenis who are suffering from the war. I hope the war will end soon. I really hope so. Um, Do you see a way out from this war? To be honest with you, like if there is one, one country can stop the war in... In Yemen, it will be United States. And what did you say about the thing with the guns? The only reason why the war still exists in Yemen for five years so far, it's because United States, unfortunately, investing in the war in Yemen by selling weapons. If United States stop selling weapons to the countries who's doing the war in Yemen, including Saudi Arabia, the war will end the second day. You know what happened? Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, he did a resolution in the Senate against selling weapons to countries doing the war in Yemen. And the Senate, the Congress, they approve it, actually. Mm -hmm. President Trump did veto against that resolution. Mm -hmm. Veto, yeah. Mm -hmm. Veto, so mm -hmm. thank you. And he said that I can't reject all that money that comes. Mm. That's why the war is still continuing in Yemen. Money. Mm -hmm. Money. So, Mohammed. Tell us, how can we support you? How can we support the people of Yemen? How can we support the refugees? How can we support people of different faiths coming together? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say like less about me and like more about helping refugees in Yemen. And if you mind, I will, I will speak about that. Okay. Uh, for refugees, for example, like I want people to know that back in Yemen, and I, we had like a... A dictatorship system where they created a fake enemy for us, right? And the fake enemy was mostly Jews in Israel. But also here in the United States, you have also people created a fake enemy called refugees and immigrants. Refugees and immigrants have a hard time right now in the United States. I had um, a little bit hard time getting my documentation here in the United States. But Imagine that I have a movie, I have a book, I have support from senators and Congress, and I was able eventually to have my documentation. What about other refugees who doesn't have any kind of support? I would like to ask each one of you, if you can go and speak to a refugee and immigrant, have a tea with them, coffee, and just speak with them. They really need it. It means a lot to us, to refugees and immigrants, to feel that we are belonging. And ask them about their stories. Trust me, their stories will be much, much better than my story. And the second thing is that I will say a lot of my friends, immigrants and refugees, unfortunately, they decided to leave the United States. They decided to go either to Canada or to go to other countries because the situation in the United States became so hard for them. I hope we can change that. And the way how we can change it is by pushing the Senate and the Congress to help the refugees. So please keep that in your mind when you contact with your senators, with your contact with congressmen and women, and ask them about how we can help refugees and immigrants here in the United States. There is one organization do an amazing job, which is actually, the, f uh, the founder is a Baha'i, uh, called Tahereh. Mm -hmm. Tahereh and- Justice the f Center, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Tahereh Justice Center. Laylee miller Murrow, who founded and, it, was on and, this podcast. Yeah. And, and Laylee is an amazing friend also of mine. What they do, they do an amazing job to help refugees and immigrants who, doesn't, who can't have a lawyer because it costs a lot of money to have a lawyer. And they give them free lawyers. In order to do that, they need your support. So if you want to help refugees and immigrants, maybe that's one of the organizations that you can donate to and support to. And the second thing I want to speak about Yemen. 
uh, people in my country are suffering. And the suffering of, of my country, I can't just think about it a lot because it gives me nightmares. How I can live here in the United States having a book and movie while my people are suffering. I hope we can do something for it. And the first thing to do, we need to keep pushing the American government to stop selling weapons to Yemen. That's how we can help people in Yemen. And the other thing is that a lot of people in Yemen are suffering. Yemen became now the most, the, the biggest crisis in the world. And to help it, there's a lot of organizations who gave food and medis, medical uh, help to Yemenis. So contact with these organizations, ask them how we can help Yemen. One of the organizations that I really think they do a lot of good work in Yemen called International Rescue Committee, IRC. So I encourage you all to contact with them. Mm. And eventually, say yes. Say yes to the people who need help. Again, these four people, when they helped me out, it didn't take from them money or superpower to help me out. It just take from them to say yes. And I hope the next time when someone asks you for help, you will be the person who says yes. That's so beautiful. Mohammed Al Samawi, thank you so much for being on Baha'i Blogcast. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much and good night. <laughs>